Good morning or good afternoon, depending on when you are watching this uh, recorded presentation. Uh, my name is Matt Wakefield. I am the CDBG Program Manager here at OCRA. Um, and the purpose of this video is to walk you through everything you'll need to know in order to uh, successfully submit a proposal application for our uh, COVID Phase 2 CDBG program. In the past, we've required grant administrators. However, now we are no longer requiring grant administrator to complete this application or this proposal. Uh, so this is really a um, open to anyone from the community or seasoned grant administrators uh, to show how you walk through the steps to create, fill out, and submit a proposal for the COVID Phase 2 program. As you can see, or as you will see, um, our application system, our Indiana Grant Management System, uh, was designed for our construction grants in mind. Um, and so we are still using our current system. However, we'll need to make some modifications as we're filling out our applications in order to meet the needs of our COVID program requirements. So as we walk through the section, um, and if you're following along with the step-by-step -step guide that's also being released today, uh, you will be able to see that there are some situations where you'll need to fill in what we call dummy data, which is dates that are obviously wrong or sections that are not, um, that just are placeholders or fillers uh, for either areas that aren't applicable or things that will be filled in later. There are also sections where it says to put in one thing, but you'll actually be putting in another thing. Um, and we'll go through that and the guide that has been uh, released today as well um, puts in detail um, what those need to be in order to successfully complete this application, uh, this proposal application. So to start, for those of you who do not, who have never accessed our system before, uh, you will need to work with your community liaison, your Okra community liaison, um, and you can find that at our website, who your community liaison is for your community. Hopefully you've been in contact with them, um, and they will be able to help to get you set up in your, in our, with a username and password uh, to access the portal. Um, which is the page that you see right here, and log in. Um, once you have put in your username and password, you're going to come to what we call, and I'm on the wrong page here, uh, what we call our landing page. So this is what everyone will see when they log in successfully to our grants management system. On our grant management system page here, you're going to see the where the rows of possible other pages that you'll go to home, account details, reports, and then go to the in.gov. If you scroll down, you'll see the Lieutenant Governor's Family of Businesses, and then the highlighted hyperlink um, will take you to the application page. If you can't click on it, the application isn't currently in our grants management system. For the purposes of this application, we're going to be using the Community Development Block Grant application. Um, so if you would like to create a new Community Development Block Grant, you click on this hyperlink, and it takes you to the general information about the CDBG program. And then you're going to go down here to click here to view application. Every time you click this link, it will create a new application. So we're going to go ahead and do that, but remember, if you're going to apply and you start the application and you want to go back and make changes, clicking here will only create a new application. It won't bring you to your current application. And I'll show you really shortly how you find your current application that you've already created or are working on at this time. So we're going to click Create a New Application. And it brings up a CDBG proposal. So this is just the proposal. Once we go through the, you submit the proposal, um, it'll be reviewed, you'll get feedback, 
and you will get uh, moved to the CDBG application section. Um, all of the content that you create will stay there, everything that you put in uh, will remain, but it will move from proposal to application. So the first thing you're going to see here is that your grant application has something called an ABM um, number, is what we call it, and so this one is 1745. Each one of these is unique, so each application has its own number. Uh, so this is what you're looking for when you uh, want to access it. So say you've done some of these sections below, but you want to um, quit working, come back with more information, and work on another section later. Um, you can go ahead and when you log back into that home page, you're going to go to account details, and then grant applications tab. The grant administration is for applications that have been funded, and the administration record uh, shows up here. So if you have any of those, they would show up in your grant administration. But for this purposes, we only know the grant applications. And it's going to bring up automatically the recently viewed. And so you may not have, um, it most likely will show up here, but it may not. And so if you are um, not seeing anything in this column, it may be because you haven't actually viewed any of the applications or it didn't show up as viewing the application. So then you would come down here and you're going to select my grant application, or sorry, my CDBG grant proposal, and it should bring up all your CDBG proposals. And so we see a 17, 7, 1745, which is the one we just created, and we're going to go ahead and click on that hyperlink here to bring us back to that application. So this is your main page, and you're going to note that there's a couple things blank, and we're not going to worry about those yet. Those will change in due time. So in order to successfully complete a proposal, every one of these 13 sections needs to be completed. And, not, and because of the way our CDBG construction grants are laid out, you would naturally go through all these and complete them and you wouldn't need and you would be able to fill out all the information. Because you're do, we're doing a COVID application, which is different, lies outside of our general applications, uh, construction grants, um, we're going to need to fill in um, creatively some of the other sections that we normally wouldn't necessarily be applicable in order to make sure that all of these get to completed. You'll notice that this submit button down here is red and doesn't do anything because it just it brings up and says it will once all sections are complete. So it won't allow you to submit this proposal until all of these sections are completed. So it is important to make sure that you do follow the instructions to ensure that we are able to get to completed because if you're unable to submit past the deadline your application likely won't be considered for funding so if you do run into any issues need any assistance from myself or your community liaison uh, we encourage you to reach out to us early and often um, so that we don't get to a situation uh, where your application might not be submitted on time. So we're going to start with section one in applicant contacts. And you can click here to edit the section. Um, you'll notice there is a picture inside of a picture on some of these, and it gets a little confusing because um, there's multiple scroll bars. Um, so just be aware of that if you scroll down, but you can't see it. It might be because you need to adjust one of the other scroll bars. Um, one of the uh, hints that we like to say or use is if you right click, uh, then you get this whole suite of uh, options on one of these click to edit sections, and then you hit click link to open a new tab. It'll give you just a little more control uh, and able to see all of the sections here. So 
we're going to start with applicant contacts, this first one right here. Um, these red arrow, these red dots typically indicate that this is a required section. So if I try to save right now, I'm going to get all of these errors because I didn't fill out all of the required sections. And all of these required sections may not be applicable to your COVID application, but because the grant system won't allow you to move forward unless you meet all these uh, required sections, I'm going to walk through and show you what you should be entering and uh, what you don't need to enter as part of this. Some of these red dots don't actually apply to the proposal, but do apply to the application section, but we're going to do our best to fill out as much of it as possible so that when you get to the application, you don't have to worry about it then. So the first thing is the lead applicant, and you'll notice you can't type in anything here. You actually need to look up your applicant, the lead applicant. So if you're a town, a county, a city, or a town, um, your community's information may or may not be in our database already. So we're going to search for it before we create a new one. So we're going to click this magnifying glass, and it brings up this little window here, and there is a search function here, and it brings up some of the things we've put in the past. So in this case, we're going to use the town of Colette. And so in order to search for the town of Colette within our database, I'm just going to type in Colette. Um, so if your community, you don't have to write city of or town of, you can just put the proper name. And if it's overlapping with a county or there's multiple, you might find there's multiple that come up here, but you're just going to search by the name and the name of your community. And then we're just going to hit go. And it brings up three potential clients, um, all that have Colette as part of it. So for the one that we want, and this is going to be a common issue, is you're going to see Colette comma town of and town of Colette because they were entered multiple times under different names. We've done our best to merge those, but every once in a while someone may create a new one or there are older ones that didn't get merged. But for our purposes, we want all of our communities to be Colette town of, Colette city of, or in the instances of counties, it would just be Colette County. Now, let's say that Colette, the town of Colette, didn't exist in our system. In that case, we've run the lookup, we've tried to enter it in, we don't see it. Here we're going to hit new. And in this case, we would type in Colette town of, and this is a required field because it creates a new what we call client, but it's really just your community. And then you can enter as much of this information as you have available, but the only thing that's technically required right now is this town of Colette, and then you would hit save. But we already know there is a town of Colette, so I'm not going to create a new one. I'm just going to hit cancel. And then I'm going to do go, and I'm going to select Colette town of. So you'll see that it enters it in to this lead applicant section right here. And then I'm also going to select the county in which the town of Colette is. For the purposes of this, we're going to pretend it's Putnam County. We have noted that sometimes this county code changes as you go through the process. You don't need to worry about that. If it changes to a different county, sometimes that happens. But actually, all of the county information will be within this lead applicant, so we don't so it won't be a major concern if this changes. Um, you may be frustrated if you try and fill all this in. You'll notice that these fields down here filled themselves in automatically when we selected the town of Colette. If you are creating a new lead applicant or community, these fields will remain blank until you actually go into the town of Colette at a different screen and enter this information in. So you will need to go enter this information in at some point, but for the purposes of this application, you can still save if these four fields remain blank. But at some point, you will want to put this information in. 
The same thing for the town of Collette goes with the chief elected officials and the clerk treasurer. For this application, you likely will not have a subrecipient, you likely will not have an engineer, and you likely will not have an architect. These are not required fields, so you should not, real, you should not realistically be putting anything into those. However, we do want your chief elected official contact. So again, this is where we're going to hit the magnifying glass and we are going to search for them by name. Uh, usually the last name works, um, but in this case, we're gonna say it's Megan and we're gonna hit go and see if Megan's already in our database and we'll see that Megan H from the town of Collette is in our database. We're gonna select them. They are our chief elected official and our clerk treasurer we know is named Matt. And usually you'd use the last name of the person because there might be a lot of Matt's. Um, and we're gonna hit go and Matt W, we know is the clerk treasurer. We're gonna select them. And then we're gonna move on down to, um, so if they are not in the field already, if they aren't in there, you can hit new create a new, um, excuse me, create a new um, uh, contact for either the chief elected official or the clerk treasurer. And I'm gonna move this screen up. You'll hit save at the bottom if you wanna create a new one. In this case, we don't need to create any more new ones. And so once we have all of those selected, you can select them and we're good to go. I'm going to X out of this since we have our those two done and then we can skip over these. These are not required and you will not have them for the purposes of this project. And we're going to go to these two required fields. And this is if you have any open grants at the time of application. For our COVID program, this question isn't applicable. So typically we have requirements that you can't have more than two open grants as a, as a town or city and three if you're a count, as a county. Um, so in this case, we're just gonna answer yes or no. It won't throw you out. So if you do have three open grants, you can hit yes. And then if so, please enter what they are. If you have a previous WDW or SIP, it'll have a grant number associated with it and you can enter that in. If you don't have any grants, you can just type in NA and then we're gonna hit save. And you'll notice that that first section went to completed. So we're gonna go through and fill out all the rest of these. These first two are the most involved, at least in our grant administration, our grant uh, management system, online system, as well as the uploads. Um, but all of the information is necessary in order to successfully submit the application. So we're gonna go click to edit section for project information. And this is an important one here. We know the program that you're actually applying to is the COVID-19 program. But for the purpose of this application, it's important that you select Main Street Revitalization. The reason you're selecting this is because we'll be able to filter it into and then change it to our COVID program. If you don't select Main Street Revitalization, we won't be able to find your application and we won't be able to then convert it to a COVID program. So we're going to do Main Street Revitalization and the eligible activity, if you scroll all the way down, it's gonna be either one of these two. You're either gonna be doing grants to businesses to retain LMI jobs or loans to businesses to retain LMI jobs. So in this case, I'll select grants. You're going to put in the estimated number of beneficiaries. So these are the number of uh, jobs that would be retained through this grant, through the grants that you will give out. So in this case, we're going to assume that, or estimate that it'll be about 2000 number of beneficiaries, people whose jobs are retained. And then we're gonna put in our project address. Some of this stuff can be auto-filled. In the case, we're gonna do our offices. So you're gonna have your project address, the city and the zip. We know that there's not an address specifically for this project, so it will likely be your town hall, 
your county seat of government, um, wherever it is that would be your project address where you'd be administering this grant from. And then you're going to find the county in which your community is in. And in this case, we're going to just select Clinton County and you're going to hit this arrow over. Sometimes communities are in multiple counties. Sometimes projects are bigger than one, just one county. Um, so you do have the option to add more than one. But if you do select too many, you can just hit the arrow over and bring it back. So this is your chosen one that you have here. And then finally is your method of procurement. Not everyone will be using a grant administrator. If that case, you go down to not applicable. But if you are doing grant administration procurement through RFP, RFQ, local funds, or not yet procured are your options. In this case, I'm going to say not applicable. Architect and engineer, you likely do not have an architect or engineer for this project, so you can put not applicable. And then, find, and then also the year the Fair Housing Ordinance was adopted or most recently updated. So in this case, we're going to say it was most recently updated in 2017. If you do have a, you won't have a CDBG planning grant pertaining to this, you can skip over this. And then finally, if you can add your state senator and your state representative, as well as your U.S. representative. Again, we understand that there might be multiple in some of the cases. Or state representative in your county or larger community, but we are asking you to select one at this time and we'll note later where other ones might be. And you're going to go ahead and click save. So we've already completed two sections, a few more to go, but you'll find that they start going quicker and quicker as we get through this process. For national objectives, we know that all of these the national objective is going to give benefit to low to moderate income jobs. So we're going to select that one. And then the justification, you're going to put in the justification, which is specifically the number of um, how you'll meet that. So just a brief description. And I'm just going to put in some dummy data here, but you should put in how you're planning on meeting the benefit to low to moderate income jobs as well as your census, which you can find using the HUD mapping tool, uh, which should give you the census. And so typically, and so you might be 49%, so you put in 49. And then list the census tract numbers included in the project area. So each one of these, you're going to list your census tract number, and they can be separated by a space. You could also choose to do enter if you just wanted to delineate each one by entering them in at a time and so on and so forth. Same thing with the block groups. You're going to enter your block groups and you can do enter or separate them by space. I don't recommend mixing them up, but just so that you put in all of the census block groups that are available. Income survey, because we are doing a benefit to income uh, low to moderate income jobs. This will not be applicable at the time of application, so you don't need to worry about this section. Same thing with light clearance. You don't need to worry about that either. So we're going to go down to the end and we're going to hit save. And that has been completed. The next four sections are what we call our, uh, sorry, excuse me, the next three sections are what we call our narrative portions of our application. And so to start, we'll go to project description. And typically for the project description um, and all the other narrative sections, these can fit about one page of single or two pages of single space um, written writing to two and a half pages. Um, so we recommend that you work on these in a word processor. So that way you can have multiple eyes looking on them. Uh, it's easier to edit. And then you would then copy and paste into the application. 
And so a good note of if you are copy and pasting a large block of text in here, you're going to want to go through and make sure it is formatted correctly the way you want it to. Things like italicies or bolding won't come through when you copy and paste it, so you'll need to make sure and see, um, think of ways in which you could uh, potentially, instead of using the bold or italics, use all capitals if you want to really call out that information. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to put some dummy data, but I do want to say that, um, that the scoring committee will be reading this section, and so this is for your basic uh, program description for this section that says summarize planning efforts already occurred. This is what's going to be the program description section uh, of your application. And each um, this box is, counts the number of characters. So each time you type something, each letter is a character. Um, and so it can allow up to 8,000. If you use a line break, that counts as one character. So that's two characters right there just to do a line break. Um, using line breaks is really helpful for the scoring committee to be able to understand your project, so it's not just one giant block of text. It's also very helpful for you to organize your thoughts into paragraphs, so we encourage you to use those. It does take one character or two characters, but um, we find that it's very helpful for um, competitiveness of applications uh, and clarity for the scoring committee to be able to read them. This project description is unique in that there is a second box here. It's called summary of work. And what we've asked for in both our construction grants and for COVID grants is that the summary of work is the, we think of it as the media section. So these are a one to two paragraph blurb, very short, four to eight sentences, telling if we were to release a statement to the media, telling the media what this project is. So what the need was, who benefits, and then what specifically are the grant dollars going towards and what they're being used for. So this won't be scored by the scoring committee, but we do encourage you to fill it out in a clear, comprehensive way showing how these dollars will be spent and who will be benefiting and what they'll go towards completing. So I'm also just going to put in a little more dummy data here. You will have a detailed program description and media section, and then you can go ahead and hit save. So you can see that we are now at uh, four of the 13. Project need, this is your program need. This is why you need um, your need for this program that you're creating. You'll add copy and paste in your detailed narrative. I'm just going to use the dummy data for this. And then financial impact is your program management section. I'm just going to add dummy data once again. And those have been completed. So you should be able to work on these outside of our Indiana Grants Management System and then copy and paste them into these sections to complete them. Section 7, this is an important one um, because it has a number of um, what we call um, validations within this table. Um, it's an interactive table, as you can see, and it has clear activity categories for the construction, what you would typically see for our construction projects. Obviously, these don't match one-to-one -one for a COVID um, jobs program. So this is where we have very detailed destruction, uh, construct, uh, directions in our step-by-step -step guide. And I'm going to go through here a quick example of what you would need to fill out and where you should be putting some of these elements. So for administration, in the CDBG column, so these are the requested funds. So anything in CDBG, these are the grant requests. The local, this is your local match, which for this grant you are not required to have a local match. However, if you do have local match dollars, this they would be in this section here. And then finally is ineligible. These are funds that are going towards the project, but they are ineligible. Uh, portions of the project or are 
other funds that can't be counted as match or are not grant dollar requests. So if you are using other CDBG dollars or other federal dollars that do not count towards your local match, as determined by our program staff, they would go in this ineligible total. So we still know the total of the project. However, um, they are dollars that do not count as your local match. So in this case, our administration, which there is a cap on, you can only have so much administration. For our typical construction grants, it's 8%, but for this one, it's less. So we're going to say that we're going to use $2,000 of CDBG dollars for our administration. And then your actual, what we call, what are here, our construction costs, this is where you're going to put in your CDBG, or this is the line item for the actual loan or grant dollars. So the administration is money used for the administration of the loans or the grants, but these are the actual dollars that you will be um, um, granting or loaning uh, is in these construction costs. So these would be what we typically would be considered economic development. We're asking you to put them here. So we're going to say the bulk of the money that you're spending is actually the, you're requesting, we're going to say the request is for 200000 for these, what we're calling construction, but are actually economic development, and then only 2000 for administration. And if you do have a local match that you're matching for this, you could put it here. If your local match is going to hire a grant administrator, you'd put it here. This land acquisition, you should not have any land acquisition because of the nature of this project. There would be no reason you would have anything in this um, line item. So if, so everyone, regardless of whether you do have a local match or not, we are going to put in the local section under land acquisition 62,500. There's a very specific reason. This is because the local match has to be at least 20% of the project total for the project. And because the request, uh, the maximum amount um, of the request is, is um, the 20% of that is 62,500. So every project should and must put in 62,500 in this section right here. Chances are you will not have anything else for these line items down here, but if for whatever reason you do have professional fees associated with it, that you're using local or CDBG, you would put those in here on these, on these line items. And then this budget creates total tallies and a total, this is your total project budget. The reason it's important to have this here is because this table, what we say, it talks directly to the next table. So in order to successfully complete this table, you need to have the 20% of your local match be part of this table, which we've done by having this 62.5. But it also talks to this local matches source table, which comes down here. So if, and in this case, I'm going to show you what you put in if you have no other local match that you're putting in. So if you're just not adding any of your own local match, but you did put in 62.5 in this section, you're going to use source type other. Source, you're going to write in other. And then the amount is 62.5. And then you're done. It's important that this number for total local match matches this number. So your total local both match. So in the case where you actually had an extra $5,000 that you're adding to the local in your construction costs, you're then going to put in where that funds are coming from. Is it coming from a loan or a grant or is it an in-kind match? So 
So if it's a grant that you have that you're adding, you can say it's a grant and it is for the Good Town grant. It's the source of that grant. And then you put in that 5,000. And you'll see it goes up to 67.5 and that matches this one, which is 67.5. So it's important to always put in this number because they need to match. These two elements need to match and you need to have this 62.5 as part of this land acquisition. So you need to have these line items in there. So I'm going to remove these really quick just for the purpose of this. And you'll notice that it changes back. This changes back. And then this worksheet, this cap gap calculation worksheet, you can go ahead and skip this section. It automatically tallies up for you, but you don't need to see that. And you can go ahead and click save. In this financials and gap, if this is off, if these don't read correctly, you're gonna get one of those errors. So if you do have a section here that you did have the 5,000 here, but you didn't add it somewhere else, you're gonna see that it won't allow you to save because they don't equal. So you do need to rectify and make sure those are equal. If you don't include this amount here and this local says zero, you're gonna get another error saying that it doesn't meet the 20% requirement. So it must be 20% of this total project cost it must be from local. Again, doesn't matter for your grant. For the COVID program, we're not concerned with that. But in order for you to be able to successfully submit this proposal, you're going to need to have this placeholder or dummy data in so that you're able to successfully submit it. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit cancel so it doesn't save any of that information. And you can go back and edit any of these sections and go change around any of these things that you have already saved. So we're already on to our public hearing. And you will know that um, for this program, a public hearing isn't required at proposal. It's required at application. So you're going to see that for this um, for our construction grants, we typically require one at proposal and one at application. And those dates need to be um, when the notice was posted and when the public hearing, the first public hearing, those need to be 10 days apart from the date in which it was posted, um, following the date in which it's posted. So there is a calculation in here making sure that they are in fact at least 10 days apart from the date that it was posted. So if you have not done your public hearing yet, you are going to need to put in some placeholder data for this. And so for this required at proposal, we know if you've already done your public hearing, go ahead and put in those dates. So we did it, we started it on June 9th, and then our public hearing was on the 20th. That's great. But let's say that we haven't actually done it yet. So here's what we're gonna do what we think our public hearing is going to be. So we believe our public hearing before application is gonna take place on the 17th. This is when we're gonna have, it's gonna post as notice, and then it's actually going to be um, held on the 30th. So these would then fulfill that, that uh, element. Um, and we're going to leave this second section blank. You won't need to fill that out yet. And then if you did third party authorization, you would then select this. If not, you don't need to. And you would also fill in the name of who was authorized to complete that third party element. So then you can go ahead and click save. And that reads as completed. Um, this is a good time to point out, and you may have noticed that section 12 got completed already, and we haven't touched that one. The reason that went to complete already is because in project information, you selected 
Main Street Revitalization. If you selected Main Street Revitalization, utility rates are no longer something that we are looking for. So it automatically goes to completed. If this is still something that's not completed, you might want to check and make sure that your project information, the program that you have selected is Main Street Revitalization. The next section, again, we're going to see a lot of what we call dummy data, and that's because this program really doesn't have a lot of the environmental review. And so the environmental review is really for contacting agencies that are applicable um, or who would have an interest in this project because you're doing some sort of physical change. Because we are not doing that, your program ER type is going to be exempt. So if it is exempt, you're not really making any changes to the physical space. So you can then put in all agencies have uh, not been contacted and it's not applicable. Again, not applicable. And then for all of these, you can pretty much go to not applicable because you will not have to uh, publish any of these or contact any of these agencies. You'll notice that it's still a requirement that you have a contact, have contacted these on what date. Because of this, we're going to ask you to put in a dummy date. And we ask that you put in 1-1-1800. One dash one dash and that's the dummy date that we use standard for this section if it's not applicable to the project that you have to contact these agencies. So you don't have to contact these agencies as part of this grant. So you can type in 1-1-1800 for the date that they were contacted because they weren't. Uh, another thing you can just copy and paste if you want to use control C, control V, and put that in. And because this is just proposal, you don't actually need to have heard back from any of these agencies in order to successfully submit. So you can hit save here um, if you want to be thorough and know that you don't want to have to come back and do this at application. You can say that they were all received already. And fill out all of these with the dummy dates. Because that application, you'll need to have received comments from them or indicate that you haven't. So we're going to go ahead and click save on that. And that covers your environmental review. Section 10 is readiness to proceed. And this is some certifications, affirmations from uh, other eight groups that you're working with. Um, because you won't have an architect or engineer as part of this, you don't need to click that checkbox. We do have site control, but because we are an exempt project and we're not doing any controlling of the site, we know that these are all going to be not applicable to this project. There's no real property. And there's no easements, there's no liens, anything like that. There's no owners that we're working with, so there should be no comments. You don't need to worry about any of these status of permitting since we don't have permitting. And then there's no displacement. So we can go ahead and just click Save. And that section should be completed as well. Again, you'll need to fill in those required fields, otherwise it will not allow you to upload these. Pause. All right, and we are on the home stretch. The final section, um, specifically the uploads, um, is going to be a little more involved than the last ones that we just kind of breezed through. Um, but it should be pretty simple and hopefully clear, um, everything you need to do. You'll see there's two sides here. There's the proposal required files and the application required files when you click on that uploads. And so these are going to be documents that you are uploading from your computer um, to help support um, or 
fill in some of the threshold requirements for the grant. So at proposal, you are required to upload each one of these required files. Your fair housing ordinance, your drug-free policy, as well as a scope of work document that supports your narrative section, a project area map showing an area of everywhere that you will be, the project takes place, your financial documents, a detailed budget, as well as your public hearing documentation. You're also required to do a four-factor analysis uh, for language proficiency. And finally, environmental documentation. So we understand that not all of these apply to your project. However, once again, in order to successfully submit, the system needs to have a document uploaded for each one of these required files. So for a number of these, they are going to be applicable. So you'll want to upload that document directly here. Um, however, for some of them, you're going to upload a placeholder. So each one of these in the required fields, and same thing goes for application, but we're going to focus on proposal, uh, can be found in this selected document. Um, drop down menu, as we call it. Um, so if you are looking for your, um, the first required field is that fair housing ordinance. So we're going to select fair housing ordinance. And then we're going to choose the file from our computer. So these are our files that are on your computer or a hard drive. Um, so you're going to go ahead and choose this, Hit choose the file. And my computer is moving a little slow today. It's been a long, hard week. Hopefully yours is moving a little quicker when you do uh, yours. Um, but I think you'll eventually we'll get a full screen here. And so I'm going to select the folder. Let's see, it's on my desktop. Um, and you'll notice that I've labeled them so I can clearly find it. And so this is my fair housing ordinance. It's saved as a PDF. And that's important because our system does not accept all kinds of documentation, um, different files. So if it is a certain type of Word file, it might not accept it. So we really recommend saving your documents as PDF um, or in the case of the detailed budget as an Excel. So we are going to open our fair housing ordinance. And you'll see that it comes up here as fair housing ordinance, PDF, and then we are going to hit the upload selected file. It is important to note at the top that your uploads must be smaller and 10 megabytes in order to upload. So make sure that the file size is below that. You will have that case if you have a lot of high quality detailed maps. If it's saved at a very high resolution, it will have a lot of megabytes. So be cognizant of what you are trying to upload. And so then we're gonna go ahead and hit the upload selected file button. And it resets and shows us that our file has been downloaded here under file name, gives the date it was uploaded on, as well as the application that it's attached to. And then the name of it was Fair Housing PDF. And then it, this file description is this Fair Housing Ordinance. And so what the system is checking is that this file description, Fair Housing Ordinance, this corresponds to this required file, Fair Housing Ordinance. So even if I had uploaded my detailed budget and said it was the Fair Housing Ordinance, it would still come up as meeting that requirement. So this isn't actually checking that what you've uploaded is correct. It's checking that what you uploaded matches, that the required files here match the required files that you said it was in the dropdown. So the next one that we have is our detailed budget. So we're going to find that. Go ahead and choose the file. And so we can go ahead and then select our detailed budget by double clicking or hitting that open. And you'll 
the detail budget, Excel file, and then we can hit upload. And so I'm not going to walk through and do each one of these. If you do end up finding out that you uploaded the wrong document and you want to delete it, you can go ahead and hit delete and it will remove that file. Um, so through the power of uh, the internet, I will um, we'll skip over a lot of these and we'll still be able to submit, but you'll want to make sure that you do have a record uploaded for each one of these. So for some of these, that you are not required to have, such as environmental documentation or your public hearing, advertisement, affidavit, sign-in, minutes. All of those are required for the public hearings, but not at proposal. So you'll need those for the first one um, at some point, but not necessarily now. So if you have it, go ahead and put all this information in. If you don't, put in a placeholder document for each one of these basically saying we have not yet held our first public hearing. We will be doing it at application. We expect the date for that public hearing to be on this date. We expect the advertisement to run on this date. And you can put that in as a placeholder for each one of these. You need a placeholder, otherwise you will not be able to submit at the end. Same thing with environmental documentation. This project will not have environmental documentation. Save that as a PDF. Upload it under environmental documentation, which is down here at the bottom, and then choose that file, that PDF saying environmental documentation not needed for this project, and then that will satisfy the requirement of having all the file descriptions matching all of the required files. And then you'll be able to hit save. So in this case, it tells you all of those that do not, that have not been saved yet. So you need to fill out all of these in order to successfully save. But you might not have them at this time. So in this case, in this section, you are able to hit cancel and then go back to your uploads. And all of your uploaded files are still saved. So they're still there, even if you hit cancel and aren't able to hit save. So you will need to make sure that they are uploaded into the document, but you can hit cancel and they should still save. In order to save you some time and you didn't have to watch me upload each one of those documents, uh, so we've gone ahead and completed the uploads and then hit save where we had all of those documents and it changed to completed just like the rest. As we talked about before, utility rates changed automatically completed, so we don't need to worry about that one. And then this final section is legal. And this one is a big long section with a lot of certification. Um, so we do encourage you to read through and certify for the civil rights. Same thing with your signage. These aren't technically required until application, um, but I encourage you to read through them thoroughly, make sure that you understand for legal. Um, there are a couple of required fields, what we call FAFADA. And so these are basically a yes or no question that you'll need to fill out based on uh, your grantees, your revenue. So in this case, we're gonna say yes and yes, but you'll fill those out. You'll click the checkbox affirming that this is correct. And then you'll have to do this authorization of submission. And so you're going to check box this, you affirm the, all of the above, and then you'll also date it on the date in which you are signing it or authorizing it. And then finally, is this multi-jurisdictional one. If you are a multi-jurisdictional project, please never you do not need to check that if not. And then you can go ahead and click save. So you'll notice that once all of these have gone to completed, all 13 sections, this button changes to blue and clear. Um, so with outline. So at this time, you can click on it 
and it says that your application was successfully submitted because you had all of these as complete. So you can click OK and you'll change to proposal submitted and then there's no more button down here. It's then on OCRA, we go through, read the proposals, look at the documentation you provided, and then give you feedback on it. But once you've put that in, you can no longer edit any of these sections. So once you hit submit, it is submitted. So make sure that everything is what you want it to be because you'll be unable to edit these sections further. You'll notice that that save button is gone, only a cancel button. However, this is just a proposal. So if you did all of this and got completed and downloaded all the uploads, hopefully most of the information is what you wanted it to be. But we are asking you to make sure that before you do click that button, make sure that you have everything in your proposal that needs to be there and make sure everything is filled out as thoroughly as possible for that. So that concludes our presentation. If you do have any questions about the technical aspects of our Indiana Grants Management System um, or filling out your application, um, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, it is Matthew Wakefield, and you can reach me at mwakefield at okra.in.gov. You can find my information on our website. If you have questions about the application and what needs to be in there and filling it out um, for your community, those questions, um, we ask that you contact your community liaison. And if they need assistance from someone in our CBBG staff, uh, they will loop us into the process. Um, but if you have technical issues with your password or accessing the grants, um, please do not hesitate to reach out to myself or your community liaison uh, can be of assistance to you. Um, so with that said, uh, thank you very much for watching this presentation and I look forward to reading your proposals.